Amen. Okay, keep your place in uh, 1 Kings 22. Keep your place. Let me get there myself. 1 Kings 22. Keep your place there. We're going to be exploring this story for um, the sermon this morning and also um, learning what we can from this story. I want to tell you this, this story in introduction to the sermon series that's coming up in the next three or four weeks. And you say three or four weeks is a long time, but it, this is an important subject. And the, what I want to talk about is the importance of the doctrine of separation in the Bible. Okay, and the doctrine of separation um, for the Christian is found not only in the Old Testament, but not only in the New Testament, but in the, New, in the Old Testament as well. It is clearly taught throughout the entire Bible. And what I want to get across to you today, we're going to talk about very specific instances in your life for the next uh, three or four weeks. But I want to talk about the seriousness of not separating this morning. And you should be a little uh, concerned. If, if, if you walk away this morning and you're not concerned about your family, you're not concerned about you know, not separating properly, then I failed this morning. Okay, so keep your place in 1 Kings 22. We'll get to the story in a little bit, but turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in the New Testament. So the doctrine of separation in the Bible is very serious for the Christian. We are not to be, um, you know, we'll see in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's just see what the Bible has to say before we get into the story. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, the Bible reads, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel is an unbeliever, someone that's uh, not saved. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in chapter 2. So we see that the doctrine of separation is clearly taught here. You, as a saved believer, are supposed to be different than other people. Now, your works obviously do not save you, but as you live your life, you are not supposed to be the same as those around you. So if people around you look at you and they look at your family and they say, hey, um, it looks the same as everybody else, you are, you are not doing things right. You know, the Bible says that we are to be a peculiar people, meaning we're to be different. Other people are going to know we're different. People are going to notice this, okay? Things that are different are not the same. Things that are separate are not together, okay? Pretty basic stuff. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 20. On the individual level, this is what this means for you. On the individual level. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 20, the Bible reads, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. Sanctified meaning set apart. Set apart. And meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So if you want God to use you individually, you better separate yourself. Okay, if you want to be used of God, if you want to be meet for the master's use, separate yourself individually. This is found throughout the entire Bible. It's a doctrine that, if not followed, has serious consequences. Okay? Look, I, I, um, I remember I, I was talking to my wife before we even moved to Sacramento. And I was talking to my wife about, you know, I saw these consequences coming with my family. I saw the consequences of not separating and not doing these things. I saw this uh, clear as day, which meant I was going to have to make some major moves in my life. And I was, you know, I was walking with my wife one day, and we were getting ready to leave our home, to leave our, our life, our business, our family. 
And I told my wife, you know, I, I said, it would almost be easier if we didn't know the truth. Can you relate to that? Amen. That it would almost sometimes be easier. It wouldn't be right, and you obviously wouldn't want that, but it would be easier if you didn't know the truth, what I said to my wife. We obviously were still going to make those same decisions because the consequences are the consequences. I got a guy uh, saved one time. I gave him the gospel, and, and, I, and he accepted it, and he accepted the gospel. And I had done, in this case, the guy really understood um, I had explained the chastisement of God and how when you get saved, you know, you become a child of God and you're going to be under God's chastisement. Whereas, you know, that's why people in this world can just get away with things that are not saved because they're going to pay in the afterlife. They're going to pay in hell. But you as a believer are going to be chastised by God. And I got the guy, I must have gotten this so clearly across to the guy that he said after he got saved and after five or ten minutes talking after he got saved, he said, I think maybe you just ruined my life. Because he was thinking about all the things that he was into and all the things that the way he lives his life, and I probably did. If he continues down that path in his earthly life, I probably ruined his earthly life. And the gospel will do that to you. You know, once you get saved, he's going to face the chastisement of God in his life. So, like, there's a reason that we're going to spend four weeks on this. Okay? There's a reason because the, the consequences for you and your family are that serious. Failure will have generational effects on your family. So let's get to our story. Garrett, if you could put up the men right away. I want to look at this story and I want to look at, first of all, I want to look at the failure of someone to separate. Okay? In 1 Kings chapter 22, that's where you're at, right? You see two men, two kings. And let's just look at verses 3 and 4. And the Bible says, And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me into battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. Jehoshaphat says to King Ahab, we are one, we are together. Okay? That's the opposite of being separated, is it not? Now, who's Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah, which is the lower um, kingdom after the kingdom split. And Ahab is the king of Israel. Okay? So, these two men in this story are kings of different kingdoms. Okay? And then we have the king of Syria. So, Ahab goes up to Jehoshaphat and he says, hey, this guy's our enemy. This guy's, you know, he's against us and he took our land. You see how he's pulling Jehoshaphat in here? And Jehoshaphat, just hook, line, and sinker, he takes it. So let's look at who these men are. Flip back in your Bible to uh, chapter 21 and let's look at Ahab. I'm going to have Garrett put up the family tree here for you all to see. So it's very hard to... Um, when you read the Bible and you read all these different names, I want to give you kind of a, a visual so you can see what happens, who is who, and, and the consequences uh, of what happens here, okay? In order to fully see that, I like to visualize things. Uh, it, we don't have a whiteboard, so we have, we have tape and paper, okay? So Ahab, who is Ahab? Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 25 through 26. But there was none like unto Ahab. Ahab was special which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all the things as he did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So, make sure I got the sides right here. So here we have Ahab and his wonderful wife Jezebel, and then we have Jehoshaphat on this side. So Ahab failed to separate himself from the Amorites. And if you remember, the doctrine of separation is really pushed in the Old Testament by when the children of Israel went into the Promised Land, they were to wipe out the people that they took over. They were not to join with them, they were not to marry with them, because God knew that they would start serving their gods, they would start worshiping their idols, and it just happens again and again. It just proves itself over and over and over in the Bible. So Ahab was considered to be one of, the, at this point he was considered to be the wickedest king that had ever, he had beat everybody else that had ruled in the northern kingdom of Israel, which was impressive because there's been some wicked kings before him, okay? Now, Jehoshaphat, who is he? 
In 2 Chronicles 17, turn to 2 Chronicles 17. The Bible will tell us, the nice thing about the first, first and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles is it's a lot like the Gospels. The stories will repeat themselves, and you'll get a lot different details in the Chronicles stories that you will with the Kings. So you get a complete picture um, of what happens in these stories. So who was Jehoshaphat, this king that joined forces with Ahab? And the Bible reads in Second Chronicles 17, in verse 1, the Bible reads, And Jehoshaphat his son, referring to Asa, the king, um, Jehoshaphat's father, Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fences, fenced cities of Judah. And he set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David. I mean, he compares him to David, who God said was a man after God's own heart. He compares Jehoshaphat to David. And sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. And Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honor and abundance. Skip down to verse number 7. It gets even better for Jehoshaphat. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, this, these are the people who are, help, who are ruling below him, even to Benhiel, to Obadiah, and Zechariah, and to Nathaniel, and to Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And he sent them, the Levites, even Shemaiah, and Nathaniah, and Zebediah, and Asahel, and Shemiramoth, and Jehonathan, and Adonijah, and Tobijah, and Tobadonijah, Levites. He's sending them the priests, okay? And with them, Elishama and Jeroram, priests. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law and the Lord with them. And he went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. He's going out and he's making sure that all the people are saved. He's giving them the Bible. He's teaching them the Bible. He's soul winning throughout um, his kingdom. He's making sure that his people are shored up on the Bible, on God's law. He's doing a great job and God is very, very pleased with Jehoshaphat. Now don't turn there, but there's something else Jehoshaphat does. And it's in 1 Kings, you could turn there. 1 Kings 22 and verse 46. We just read it. Another thing Jehoshaphat did is the Bible says, And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. So Jehoshaphat was doing great things for God. And God always equates removing the Sodomites out of the land as a good thing. Okay, in 1 Kings, let's look at his dad. What did his dad Asa do, according to the Sodomites? 1 Kings 15 and verse 11 through 13, the Bible tells us what Asa did. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. So I just want to take a little sidetrack here for a second and tell you that, number one, Asa had removed the Sodomites. Okay? Somehow the Sodomites creep back in. Okay? So this is the nature of the Sodomites. You have to understand that this is well beyond Genesis 13 when or Genesis 19, when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. This is well past that, yet we have Sodomites coming back in. There is never a time in the Bible, and this is one of the most clear things taught in the Bible, that a society is not to accept unnatural wickedness, sodomy, queerness of whatever type, that what the Bible calls is unnatural sin. Okay, they, And you understand that, that what was Jehoshaphat doing? He was going out and he was preaching to his people. He was making sure they had the book of the law. Yet the goal was not to convert or bring these people in or fix them at all. It was to get rid of them. You understand? The Bible is very, very clear about that. We're going to hit this in much detail on Thursday. This is something you're not going to hear many other places. We're going to talk about this a lot on Thursday. We're going to talk about what the ramifications for this church are um, for this biblical doctrine, but we will draw some lines in this church, Amen. and we will not accept things that the Bible says are not to be accepted. It will not be embraced here. Amen. Okay. Now, let's get back to the story. The story. So basically, what you have happening here, if we look at 1 Kings chapter 22 and in, in, in verse number 30, just go there for a minute, but the story is this. Ahab convinces Jehoshaphat to come to him and help him fight his battle against the king of Syria. Okay? And he says things like, hey, um, you know, this guy's our enemy, 
and this guy's against us, and let's fight him, and he took our land, and he's pulling, he's pulling Jehoshaphat into this, and Jehoshaphat takes it. Jehoshaphat even goes as far as to say we should get a prophet, you know, a real prophet. Jehoshaphat is good enough to understand that the 40 yes men that Ahab um, brought with him were not real prophets. Jehoshaphat was saved. He could recognize the voice of the shepherd. He knew those guys were just yes men. You know, the guy made the horns of iron. You can just see these guys. Oh, you're going to win this great battle, King Ahab. Jehoshaphat knew that was garbage. But the funny thing is, is that when they do bring a good prophet in, um, Micaiah, you know, Ahab throws him in prison. And Jehoshaphat still goes along with Ahab. Okay, so he, he made some slip-ups here. One thing I love about Micaiah, if you look at uh, verse number 27 and 28, is this guy's a prophet, and this guy's got some courage. And that just shows you that the prophets of the Lord, if they're going to be true prophets of the Lord, they need to have some courage. Okay? And in verse 27, the king says, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction, and with water of affliction, until I come in peace. And the guy basically says, If, I co if you come back, I was a liar. He's like, because you're going to die there. He's getting thrown in prison, and he still tells King Ahab, You're going to die. That's, that's some courage. So basically, Jehoshaphat goes into this battle with Ahab anyway, all right? And in verse number uh, 30, we see that Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, and put, put, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. Now, there's a couple different reasons you could say that Ahab did this. He's like, hey, you dress like the king when we go into the battle. I'm going to kind of you know, go over here and, and be incognito, so to speak. But the first lesson I want to give you out of this story, and, and as you, we go through this sermon series, is this is a truth in life, is that the bad influences the good. When you think about the people that you are not separated from, that you should be separated from, this idea that, oh, I'm still hanging out with these people, my kids are still hanging out with these people, but they're going to change them. That's not what happens. Okay, the bad influences the good. Think about the gangs. I mean, all the gangs and all these types of issues. It's the bad, the worst people that, that are running the show in these groups of people, right? It's not, it's not the good people that are influencing the bad people. It's always the bad influencing the good. And that's what you see here. Ahab is having this horrible effect on Jehoshaphat, and he's being a terrible influence for him. So you need to think about that. You know, the Bible says, you know, train up a child. The Bible needs you, the good influence, to train up a child. And it says, when he is old, he will not depart from it. These children, they cannot go into um, situations where there is 30 kids, because in that group of 30 kids, that worst kid is going to influence the other kids. That's the way it works. So when, when they are old and they are strong, they will be able to withstand um, the attacks of these type of people. You know, it's not enough to, what I'm trying to get you at is it's not enough to stop the sin. It's not enough to say, hey, I'm done with that, I'm out of that, whatever. If you're still around it, the bad is going to influence the good. Okay? The second lesson I want to give you is there's unforeseen consequences of not separating. The story continues if you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Once again, I told you that the Chronicles will give us a, a, a better, uh, more detail of the story. Garrett, if you could put up the second generation, please. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19, the Bible reads in verse number 1, you know, Jehoshaphat almost died. The king of Israel did die, as you hear the story. He was killed in the battle, just like Micaiah said he was going to die. Jehoshaphat, you know, got out of it. Um, God, God spared him basically. Um, and it looks like, you know, Jehoshaphat probably thought he got off pretty easy. Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 19, verse number 1, he gets scolded um, by a prophet, and the prophet says to Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu the son of Han Hanani, this is not Jehu the king, this is Jehu the prophet, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now, nothing really happened to Je Jehoshaphat himself from this situation. But I want to show you what happens uh, to Jehoshaphat's family as soon as Garrett gets this, 
this put up. In 2 Chronicles chapter 21, turn there. Now, Jehoshaphat had a son named Joram. And you'll see that Ahab also had a son named Joram. Yeah, just something to point out. They named their sons the same name. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us why, but that kind of gives us an idea that these men were spending some time together. Their families knew each other. Um, there's more evidence of that. Um, because if you look at 2 Chronicles 21, verses 5 and 6, the Bible reads, And Joram was 30 and 2 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem. So Joram is the son of Jehoshaphat. He's the son of Jehoshaphat. So you say Jehoshaphat was a good man. He did great things for the Lord. Um, he probably raised that type of son. But the Bible says in verse number 6, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Like as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. And he wrought that which was evil in the, in the eyes of the Lord. So Jehoshaphat's son married Ahab's daughter. Now there's two women in the Bible. When you read the Bible and you hear about Jezebel, um, Ahab himself was just kind of a pushover to his wicked wife. He ended up doing a lot of wicked things because of um, his wicked wife Jezebel. Jezebel is one of the worst women you'll read about in the Bible until you read about her daughter, Athaliah. And Joram marries her. So this guy marries Athaliah. So he ties the two dynasties together through marriage. All right? So maybe you, know, you think that, hey, it's not a big deal. I'm hanging out with these people. Um, I don't do what uh, you know, Bob does. I've known him for 20 years. I don't do the things that he do. But what you're doing is you're showing your children that you're introducing your children to these things. And your children are learning that, that people that are living lives and, and doing wicked things, that they're really not that bad. Because what you do will affect your children more than what you say. So you better understand that your actions are being watched by your children, and maybe they marry the wrong person, as in this case. And you know what? That's a life sentence, my friends, if you marry the wrong person. The next thing that happens in the story is God is done with the house of Ahab, and God anoints a man named Jehu. God anoints a man named Jehu who is not related to Ahab. So it's another dynasty that's going to take over the northern kingdom of Israel. And he is chosen to judge. And we see this in 2 Kings chapter 9. Turn there. Let's look at it. In 2 Kings chapter 9, the Bible reads, Elisha sends a prophet to anoint Jehu. And he gives him a very specific charge. A very specific charge. And the Bible reads in verse number 7, and you shall strike, this is the prophet talking to Jehu, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master. Uh, Jehu was already a captain in the army. He was already a, a warrior. And you'll see that as, as the story continues. So that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. And I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond, or free in Israel. Then I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. These are the, the first two um, kings, dynasties that God wiped off the face of the earth. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. When God judges evil, you and yours don't want to get caught in the crossfire. Okay? In 2 Kings chapter 9, in verse number 23, if you look down just a few verses, here's what happens. Jehu take, gets anointed king, and he heads for Joram, who is now the king in Israel. So here we have Ahaziah rules first. He dies. And now Joram is the king in Israel. Could you put up uh, this, the next generation, please? We have Joram, who's now the king, when... Uh, Jehu heads to start his, his mission. And there's a son of Joram, the king of Jerusalem. See, this is why we have to put up the, the chart, because all these names are the same. Um, Athaliah and Joram have a son named Ahaziah. So you could see that this, this, she has a son with Joram. They're married, and they name him after her brother. So she's obviously influencing the situation, just like... Um, 
just like uh, her mother Jezebel did. So what we have in this story I'm about to read to you, Ahaziah is visiting his friend Joram, who was wounded in battle. So these two at this moment are together. So we have the king of Judah visiting his friend, the king of, it's his brother-in-law. He's visiting his brother-in-law. So in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9, and verse 23, the Bible reads, And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, He sees Jehu coming to kill him. He says, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And I love verse 24. You can almost hear the bow stretching in verse number 24. The Bible says, And Jehu drew a bull, bull with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms, and the arrow went out at his heart. He shot the arrow straight through him. I mean, you can just hear it. Just... And he just shoots the arrow straight through the man. And he sunk down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, hell, that when I rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden on him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. This is somebody Ahab killed, saith the Lord. Now will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. But when Ahaziah... The king of Judah saw this. He fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Ger, which is by Ibleam. And he fled to Megiddo, and he died there. He killed him too. When God cleans up the mess, you don't want to be anywhere near it. That's why you don't have anything to do with those that hate the Lord. The rest of the story, now the rest of the story, just to wrap this up, here's the unseen consequences. Jehoshaphat gets scolded by a prophet. His son marries the wrong person because he was not separated, how he was supposed to separate. He's dead. Jehu kills him. She ends up getting killed. I should have had you tape these separately. Basically, he kills him. Then there's 42 brothers on this side that he kills too. And there's 70 brothers on this side of Ahab's that he kills. He wipes out the entire family. The Bible says, anyone that pisseth against the wall. And it implies that he killed all their friends too. He wiped the slate clean and that sword cut through all the way into the family of Judah and he cut the cancer completely out. Now you say, I talked to you about uh, a few days ago about the, the lineage of David must be carried through to Christ. Well, Athaliah, as soon as her son is killed, she goes and she murders all her grandchildren so she can rule and reign. But one of the priests saves one. So we have the lineage that continues. Jehoiada the priest saves Joash. So he can continue the lineage all the way through to Christ. So God, even though he judged the house of Judah just like he judged um, the house of, of, the, of Ahab, he still kept his promise. He used Jehoiada to do that. Okay? Now, these are pretty serious consequences. Jehoshaphat, look, Jehoshaphat, when you look at the kings of Judah, I mean, top five, man. I mean, the guy was pretty awesome. Top five, maybe top three. We could debate it. But he did all the right things, but he failed to separate. And he destroyed three more generations of his family. Think about that. Think about that, guys. What you do now is, is a big deal. It's a huge deal. And you might have to upset some people. And you might, I mean, but you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta make some moves. Separation is a serious thing. That's why we're spending three more weeks on it after this. Okay? Now, I wanna talk about some application of this in a general terms, you know, talk about some building blocks before we get into these specifics with the axis of evil. I'm going to explain that to you a little bit at the end of this sermon. But I wanted to get across to you how we saw a good king who loved the Lord destroy his family because he, he, he messed up this one spot. I mean, are you getting it? Do you understand how serious it is? I mean, look at your kids. That's how serious it is. You don't know your grandkids now. Most of you, you guys are young families. Do you know your grandkids? Do you want to destroy their lives? Because you, especially you men, you have the power to do that. You understand me? Influences. Let me talk to you about influences in your life. 
In Matthew 16, in verse 18, I'll just read it for you. Jesus says this, And I will also say unto thee, unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, speaking of himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Meaning that throughout history, we can always look back, all the way back to the apostles, and we can find biblical churches throughout history. He, he's going to keep that prophecy just like he kept this one. because. But does he say that the gates of hell will not prevail against your home? Did he say that the gates of hell will never prevail against your children? Did he say that the gates of hell will never prevail against your spouse, your wife, your husband? You better, start under, you, know, you better start understanding the influences that are affecting you in your life. And the more, this is how it works, it's kind of a snowball effect, the more you get separated, the more you will see these influences. The more you are in a church like this, and you learn the Word of God, and you start taking action towards this direction, the more this, these sins will become exceedingly sinful to you. And it, you better start taking action or you will not see it. You know, look, folks, the Bible says in Ephesians 6, turn to Ephesians 6. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible says, Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you and your family. In Ephesians 6, verses 12, verse 12, the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, folks, there is an agenda to undo the Bible today. There is an agenda in these places where people are sending their kids, where you are hanging out, where what you are watching, what you are letting into your home, there is an agenda to destroy the Word of God and to destroy your family. It's a coordinated attack. It's not just stupid things people are coming up with. It, it's, it's a coordinated attack. It's spiritual wickedness. Where? In high places. It's the people in charge are, are affected. They're wicked people, and they're pushing this stuff down to destroy your family. So you better be aware of it. You better see it. There's wolves at the gates, folks. You need to start understanding that the gates of your home, the gates of, of where you're sending your children, you better start looking at it like there's a bunch of wolves trying to, trying to kill them. That's how you need to look at it. Look, I'm not, I'm not old, but I'm old enough to where I have seen parents lose their children to the world. I have seen saved parents lose their children to the world. It's heartbreaking. You can see it in their faces that they've lost their children to the world. I've seen husbands lose their wives to the world. I've seen wives lose their husbands to the world. It's tragic, but I've seen it all. And we don't want to see it here. Do you understand? Look, we were driving uh, to church yesterday. I, I, I just thought of this. We were driving to church yesterday. The influence of the world that people don't even see People in this world, they don't even know why they're doing the things that they're doing. They have no idea. We drive by a car wash, and I've always, I've always thought this when I saw this. We drove by a car wash, it must have been some track team or something like that, and it was, it was all these teenage girls out there. Talk about influences of the world. All these teenage girls out there washing cars, and you know, I'm just like, what are these parents telling their daughter every, before, in the morning they're going to this car wash? All right, honey. Um, get on your shorter shorts and, and get as naked as you possibly can so you can go wash the cars of a bunch of perverts today. What in the world? You see it all the time. I, I've seen it for years. And I'm just like, what are these parents thinking? But they're influenced. You see, it, it's normal to them. Because they go, they go to a school. They're in a, they're in a community where this is normal. The high school track, the girls track team has been doing that for 20 years. It's normal. It's the status quo. People are so influenced. They have no idea what the Bible says anymore. And they're just, you know, everybody thinks they're such independent thinkers. Everyone's just following the crowd. And the crowd is being pushed by these people in high places that are wicked people. So you better start shining some light 
on the situation with the Word of God, and you better start taking some action in your lives and in your families. Or this is going to happen to you. You think you're immune to it? It's going to be worse for you. Because when it happens to you, and you lose your kids, and you lose people in your family to this, you're going to know it. That's going to be the worst. See, those parents that have their daughters in that situation, they don't even know. They're, 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 they're blinded. They're unsaved. They're, they don't know what the Bible says. They're just going along with society. It's painless for them. But for you, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt badly. Point number two I want to make as far as application here is we're to be separated, but separated unto what is what I want to ask you. You remember when we talked about Romans chapter 1 a couple days ago? Paul was separated unto the gospel. He was separated from being a, a, a false prophet, from being a Pharisee, but he was separated unto the gospel. That became his life, was to preach the gospel. What are you separated unto? What are you separated unto? It's not enough to just separate. You must separate unto something. So let me talk to the ladies here. Turn to Titus chapter 2. Let's talk about some basic building blocks in your lives that you're going to need to be separated unto the right things. Turn to Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, if you find those T books in, in the Old Testament, Titus is in there. Titus chapter 2. In verse number 5, for the women, the Bible says this, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, if you're going to start this separation in your family, the Bible says that if you are, are married, and especially if you have children, you are not to be working. You are to be raising your own children. And it, it's impossible for you to separate your family if you are going to be sending them if you're going to work every day and you're sending them to a daycare or to a, a public school, it's impossible to separate if you do that. So that's a building block that you need. You need to have that. And the Bible says that if you don't do that, you know, I think some of these verses we see so many times that we, we take, uh, we, we start to not hear what they're really saying. We've re heard this repeated so many times. But the Bible says that if you're a, a, a mother and you do that, the word of God is, is blasphemed, it says, if you do that. If you send your kids off and you don't separate in this way and you're not a keeper at home, it says the word of God will be blasphemed. It says do these things that the word of God be not blasphemed. Meaning you would be blaspheming the word of God because you're going directly against what the Bible says. And let me tell you, if you do that, especially that one thing, there will be serious consequences. There will be serious consequences. On the flip side of that coin... Let me talk to the men. Because the men actually have the power to do the most damage here. Because you are the leader. If I'm driving a bus along a cliff, it's not the people that are riding in the bus with me that can steer the bus off the cliff. It's me, right? It's me that can drive that bus to safety, or it's me that can drive that bus off the cliff. Look, none of this works without your leadership. Now, I, th I see personally, and I don't want to, I don't really know all that much about you all yet, but um, I see a real disconnect today amongst young men especially. And even, even in churches like ours, I see a real disconnect here. You know, there's, a, there's this, these, these zealous young men. I want a virtuous woman. I want my wife to you know, to stay home and raise my kids and all these things. And, you know, but look, if you want a separated family and you want to do these things, you had better learn to work. You had better learn to work. Because you know what? If you're going to have a, in a society where both parents work, 90% of both parents work, and you're going to talk about having a, having a life where only you work, you better learn to work hard. Or this isn't going to work. You know, I've told my kids since the time that they were this tall that the worst thing you could be in life is lazy. Period. And I feel that way from the top of my head to the tip of my toes, too. If you're lazy, you can forget what I'm saying if you're lazy. Because you can't separate your family. If you're lazy and you're not willing to work for it, who's going to support them when, when all this is going on? You know, 1 Timothy 5.8 says... 
But if any provide not for his own, especially for those in his own house, he hath denied the face and is worse than an infidel. The Bible says you're worse than an unbeliever. And that's true. Amen. I mean, when, when the, it doesn't say you're not saved, but it says you're worse than an unbeliever. You're worse. You act worse. The consequences will be worse. You will destroy your family. You'll raise lazy kids. Your wife will have no respect for you. How are you going to do all these things I'm talking about if you're not willing to get out there and work? You young men, you want to get married. You're not married. You think you're going to go into some church like this and you have no job and, and you, some virtuous woman is just going to run up to you and, and want to marry you? You're living in a dream world, my friend. You better have a plan and you better, you better get things together. And then God will put things, and God will bless that. God will bless that. Look, worse than an infidel, I've seen, it's almost 100%. When, when we get these, these men that come into these churches and they're perpetually unemployed, they're not gonna, it's not going to work here. They, they, call, they cause all kinds of problems. 100% of them. They cause all kinds of trouble and problems. Some get, get, get thrown out. It's crazy. It's a serious predictor. So if you want to raise kids, you want to separate your family, you want to lead in that area, get to work. Get a plan to get to work. Amen. Spiritual leadership. You know you're the spiritual leader in your family? What are you doing to lead spiritually? These women are supposed to be silent in this church. They're supposed to learn in silence. How are they going to learn if you never do anything? When's the last time you led a Bible study at home? You know how you lead a Bible study at home? Here's how complicated it is. You, you open up the Bible, you pick a chapter, you read it 10 minutes beforehand, and then you bring your family out to the living room. This is what I do. I bring my family out to the living room, and then we all read the chapter together. And when I read it 10 minutes beforehand, I noted some things that I just wanted to talk about, and then I let my family talk about it. I'm like, hey, what do you think? You'd be shocked what your 12-year-old daughter will get out of the Bible. But I want to know. Oh, sermon ideas have come out of it for me. I mean, you're going to, and then as you keep doing this, guess what's going to happen? Your family's going to learn the Bible. <laughs> Lead your home. Lead your home. The whole exercise takes about 25 minutes. And if you get some good conversation going, it's, it's, it's a great time. Make some popcorn. We try to do it every single night there's not church. And you know what? I'm proud to say that because my family loves it so much, even when I've been busy, they now come to me and say, when are we doing a Bible study? And I'm like, uh, okay, right now. That's when we're doing it. It's awesome. Do it. Lead. It's your job. It's your job. No one else is going to do it. No one else is going to do it. Point number three, how are you reinforcing the standards in your family? <clears throat> you got your daughter and your wife, they're going to dress different than everybody else out here. Because the Bible says they should. The Bible says they should dress modestly. And you, your daughter shouldn't, shouldn't dress like a whore and go wash some pervert's car. You should dress your daughter and your wife should wear dresses and dress like ladies. And you, you should provide them nice clothes, first of all. And second of all, how are you reinforcing those standards? Are you having your daughter wear a dress and then constantly hanging around people that are dressed like the people at that car wash? They will learn to hate the standards that you are putting on them. They will learn to hate it. One of the great things that we loved about Pismo Beach, we did all kinds of research and we're like, oh, they're going to be people in swimsuits because we're not going to go there then. I'm not going to lead my family into that. I'm not going to put my daughter in that type of situation. I shouldn't be in that type of situation. My son shouldn't be in that type of situation. So, you know, do a little bit of research. It's a cold beach. Thank God. It's like Baptist paradise. That's what I told my wife. Everyone's in coats, and they're all cold. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> but it, it's great. But you have to reinforce these standards. You know, uh, when we moved to Verity Baptist Church, one of the biggest things that was on my mind when we moved from North Dakota to Verity Baptist Church, you know, in concrete, you know, in concrete, what do they put in concrete to make it stronger? Concrete has a lot of compression strength, but it will break in the tensile direction very easily. So they put in rebar, right? They put in steel 
to reinforce it. Reinforcing steel. Every time you go to Verity Baptist Church, if you've ever been to the Red Hot Preaching Conference, if you've ever been to a church service, and you've ever been there on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, and you see all those kids hanging out in the back playing horseopoly or having Lego Wars or whatever, those are all pieces of rebar on your kids. These girls walking around here today that are playing together, they're pieces of rebar on each other. It's strengthening them. They're growing up saying, hey, there's people like me that have my beliefs. They're strong Christians. They're being sharpened by their friends. It's strengthening rebar. That's what they need. Because when they get out there, people are going to stress test that rebar. They're going to stress test that concrete. They need that rebar, folks. That's what this is about right here. That's what all these kids are about right here. That's why it's so important that these kids are, are having time to fellowship and that they're in church and they're, they're not only hearing the word of God, but they're, they're fellowshipping with each other. Because they're growing up with people that are reinforcing the standards that you and you are putting in your home. It, it's, it's reinforcing them. Do you, do you guys understand that? How important that is? So what, look, what is your action plan? Men, what's your action plan? Coming to church and listening to preaching will do nothing for you if you do not take action in your life. Do you understand? Do you understand that you actually have to do something? And you might have to make some moves in your life that, that are not easy to make. You might have to have conversations with people. that I've had a lot of conversations with people that are not easy conversations to, to have. But I don't care. Because I have decided the direction that I'm going to take my family and that we're going to be separated in these certain areas. I have made a plan and then I am executing that plan. I don't care who I offend. Because I'm leading in the right direction. That's what we have to do. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect at it. But this is what we have to do, guys. In conclusion, let me just talk about what we're going to discuss in the next few weeks. We're going, to get, we're going to get detailed on this, okay? It's all about the details. These decisions are about the details. We're going to talk about, first of all, we're going to talk about your home. We're going to talk about what you're allowing into your home. Okay, look, I, I'm not here to lord over you. I am not the boss of you. I, 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 I'm not following you home. I don't want to. Even if that was my job, I don't want to do that. I'm not to lord over you. What I'm to do is tell you what the Bible says, and I want to give you some examples of the things that you're letting into your home and into your marriage that are going to destroy your family. And if I can't get that across to you from here and by talking to you and by leading you in that direction, I've, I've failed. Okay? So we're going to first talk about you know, the media, internet, TV, all these things. Look, folks, it, it, it's not as bad as you think. It's worse. And I bet you that you don't even know how much it's influenced you and how much it's continuing to influence you. We're going to talk about the public school system. I could have a 50-week sermon series on the public school system. I hate it. I hate it. It will ruin your family. And I understand that some people have to be in public school, but I want to talk, you know, some families can't homeschool. I, I get that. I'm not trying to, you know, um, well, I am kind of trying to make people feel bad. But I want to talk about the public school. I want to talk about some of the things um, that they're teaching and how they're going to undo every single thing that this book says. And when you come here and you teach the kids the Bible, and when you have Bible studies in your home, and you start leading your children in the ways of the Bible, um, the public school is undoing all of that. And they have way more time with your kids than you do to undo all this. And they're good at it. They're good at it. And then I want to talk about the third leg of the axis of evil, uh, which you see. So you see the public school system, you know, media, TV, the Internet is the second. And then I want to talk about liberal Christianity. These are the three things that I believe are destroying this country. So that's going to be the third one that we're going to discuss on the, in the third week. Look, 
Do you want to be 70 years old and have saved grandchildren that, that are walking and serving the Lord? Do you know that there's not a lot of people that can say that they've got that happening? That, that if you end up 70, 75, 80 years old with saved grandchildren and saved great-grandchildren, you will be in the minority, unfortunately. But that's what this is about. I want, to, I want to, uh, you to understand the consequences of not separating. And then I want to get into these details about how to actually separate. Okay, but what I, what I want you to keep in mind is that it's going to take some actual moves in your life to get this done. You should look different six months from now than you do today if you start implementing these things. Your kids should start act differently. Your wife, your marriage should change if you start implementing these things. You know you're not guaranteed a good marriage? You know, there's, uh, till death do us part, yes. If you stay married until the day you die, you have kept that vow. But you know there is no guarantee that you and your wife will have that great, loving relationship with each other. It's something you can destroy. So we're going to talk about all these things. Um, we're not really going to get into marriage all that much, but it's part of it. it it's part of it. We're going to have a, a sermon series on that as well. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Um, we thank you for your word, Lord. Um, we thank you for this doctrine of, of separation. We thank you for these stories in the Bible that show us how serious you are about your word, that show us that you're not a respecter of persons. Jehoshaphat was a great king, but you showed us that you're not a respecter of persons, and consequences are consequences. Lord, we thank you for all these great examples. Please bless the rest of our day, Lord. Bless soul winning this afternoon. Bless the service this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.